Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Stewart with Cleaning Business Today. I've got my partner, Liz Trotter, over there to your right, I guess. And I have the most awesome special guest for us today. And this is, uh, you know, she's got a, a unique business. I mean, most of us are in the business of cleaning homes. We uh, do maintenance cleans like on a, on, a, on a recurring basis. And we might do a move out clean and, you know, several different types of clean all in, in, in the realm of residential cleaning. Uh, Sharon Grammer is in St. Louis, Missouri, and she uh, is owner of a business called Benacore, and she's been in business since 2005. She's got a very special niche. She does uh, bio recovery work. She uh, type of jobs that her business does is everything from like crime scene and trauma. She cleans up meth labs, um, hoarder cleanup stuff that's really hazardous. You know, you've got, uh, you know, jobs where people wear the Tyvek suits and the respirators and like all the, the, the full, you know, PPE. Well, you know, that's, that's uh, basically their job every day and their 24 hour uh, a day, seven day a week operation. And we're all really interested in terms of how do we clean and clean in the COVID-19 world. And, you know, we're all getting calls from people that, you know, they have a family member that's been sick or there's an office space where somebody has been sick. And, you know, how, do, how are we going to deal with that? How, how are we going to respond to that? So, um, you know, this is a really great opportunity because Sharon knows all those answers. She can tell you what you need to know to do that type of work and what the risks are, what the requirements are. And, you know, I could go on and on, but I'd rather for you to hear it from Sharon. So how are you doing today, Sharon? Good, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Could you uh, could you tell us a little bit about your business and type of work you do and maybe some of the interesting projects you guys are currently working on? Sure. We've been in business since 2005 doing, I call specialty cleaning. We do all types of hoarder cleanup, meth lab remediation, restoration, crime, crime and trauma scene cleanup, um, vehicle decontamination, odor control. Anything that that's a special cleaning, we can get it done, and we really enjoy it. Okay, do um, you guys uh, had any increase in demand since uh, the COVID nineteen uh, epidemic pandemic uh, has come to our shores? Absolutely, and I'm sure, and I'm sure a lot of maid services have had requests too, but there's a few differences that I wanted to discuss with the maid service owners, because we also have a maid service, my sister and myself, but we have this and we're trained. So there's a lot of things that people need to know before they go out and do a deep clean for someone that they don't have no idea what really is involved. Okay. Well, share with us a little bit about, uh, well, so what, how, how much, how busy are you guys? I, I'd like to get into that. You were sharing with me a little bit about, uh, some of the work that you're doing. And I mean, you're doing some work for like, we've got this term out there that we're talking about essential services and they're essential services. And then there are essential services. And you guys are doing work for, for, for businesses. If they weren't in business, it would basically shut down everything and you guys are keeping them safe so they can do their jobs. Could you share a little bit about that? Definitely. We were very fortunate to be in contact with Ameren UE which is our big utility here in uh, Missouri and Illinois, to be one of their contractors 24 seven. That was one of their stipulations. So I think we signed contract on a Friday. Our first job was on, I think, 322nd, 322. And ever since that day, we, I don't think we've had a day off. I think we've had 32 jobs in 20 some odd days or not even 20 days. It's, it's insane. The first week was, crazy. I think we thought we were prepared. We were, we had all our stuff, our, a lot of ducks in a row, but the electric company did not. I think when the pandemic started to come to St. Louis, they didn't think it would be here as quick. So they had, they had employees. Oh my God, I need this clean. Oh, um, he said he was sick. I need my truck clean. I need my building cleaned. We cleaned a lot the first week until they figured out their systems and we, we put some protocol down on paper for them. So after this, when the second week came, there were steps to follow and people understood 
were you in direct contact with someone, a secondary, a third, third exposure. And that really helped calm down the situation and their employees because the electric company is something we all need. We need our utilities. I mean, so to give them a safe place really felt great because they actually used our expertise versus what they had to offer. I mean, it, it was, it was awesome. So when you get these calls, you're, you have to ask a bunch of questions, I guess, just to kind of figure out what problem you're trying to solve and to kind of come up with a scope of work. So is there a lot of dialogue before you guys even start doing the work? There is. We have a we have one consultant that handles our company and the Missouri, the Southern Missouri and what we work in, uh, probably a two, three hour range of St. Louis. So she tells us is a, what happened. There's we we deal with three levels. Level one is I'll read them to you. Level one suspected second or third exposure to a confirmed case, but no test. So when you say second or third exposure, what does that mean? It could be a coworker of a coworker. It could be a coworker of your spouse that they were sick, but oh. they didn't get they didn't get a test, so it wasn't confirmed. So it could be hearsay, or they could have just had the flu or a cold. So I, you know, my wife is sick, and I work with you. I'm I think I'm healthy, but because my wife is sick and I work with you, that's a second exposure. That's that's a level one. They're dealing with because there was no test. If right. there's no test and there, it's hard to get testing here because so many people have tried to get it that they've really tried to weed out the people that really aren't that sick or it couldn't be the COVID. So there's not a lot of testing available. So when I talk to, there's three levels, all three levels, I just need to know the floor plan because all three levels, I wear the same equipment because I don't like to take someone's word that Okay, level one just knew a coworker that could have been sick. Okay, it could have been his wife that had a coworker that definitely was sick. But you know, the cold, we're in the allergy season. There's a lot of things that people get mixed up and the, the way the pandemic came so quickly, I think a lot of people are scared and they just, I guess they're assuming the worst. So they just, they want the area cleaned to be, have a peace of mind so they can go to work and get their job done and not feel like they're going to get a disease that's, that could possibly kill them. What's a level two? Level two is direct or indirect exposure to a possible, but confirmed unconfirmed case, but it had a positive test. Okay. So, so there was no question about it. Somebody had COVID. Someone had COVID there. Okay. And then level three is a positive COVID test, direct interaction with a positive test. It was their, a kid, a family member, or a spouse in their immediate family or a boyfriend or girlfriend that had a confirmed case of it. So to us, like I said, all three levels, we suit up and everything's treated the same way. The only difference is on the scenario level one, we, they may only want us to do half of the building as far as high, disinfecting the high touch areas and then fogging, and then versus the second and third, we do the whole building, no matter how large it is. The trucks are the same way. Everything is, the trucks are a little different. Even if it's level one, we do everything because you understand the trucks, they are so dirty. They're like the power plants. So you really have to clean it first and then disinfect it. And it really does take twice as long to do a truck. It, one truck could take us an hour to clean it because they have all that mud and dirt everywhere caked inside the cake inside their truck so we have to get that out before we can even disinfect same way of the, of the plants that we do a lot of those tech shops um, maintenance shops they're in the mud all the time their hands are filthy the drawers with the labels they're so dirty you can't even read the labels because if they're all black because they're used to you know they know where the stuff is and what drawer it goes in but yeah. they can't read the labels so we yeah. actually have to clean that before we can actually disinfect anything. So, I mean, you get into a truck. I'm, 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 I'm imagining like a, a truck that a power worker would use. They've got to have like all kinds of tools and toolboxes and drawers. Do you yes. have to get in and clean all of that stuff too? We do. What we do, you, they can tell us whether or not the gentleman either stayed inside the truck 
or walked around this bucket truck where they have different compartments around the truck. If they didn't go inside the compartments, we still do the handles and the, the doors on the outside. If they did get into the tools, we hand wipe all the tools and then we just, we use the gun or a fogger to get in there and let it sit in. It has to stay wet for 10 times or 10 minutes. We have a 10 minute dwell time with our disinfectant that we always go by. Right. Okay. Wow. This sounds, my, my, my heart's racing a little bit. I mean, this is exciting. This is like a, this is like a TV show. <laughs> Honestly, every time we get a call, my heart races too. It's almost like it's your first job. You're like, yeah, baby, let's go. Let's go. Hey, Sharon, you said at one point that cleaning the truck would take like an hour. That doesn't sound very long if you're having to clean all of that stuff inside. Is that like kind of a, a minimum that you might expect to spend? A minimum. Yeah, because you're, they have all their, it's not like a regular car where it just has, you know, the gear shift. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of buttons, CBs, a couple other uh, pieces of equipment that they talk in and out of like walkie talkies. Um, their bucket trucks. We we even do the buckets where they have to stand in, but we have to get behind the seats. It's only the truck is only the front part. If you think about it, it's like the cab. Sometimes oh, yeah. two people can sit there, and then sometimes three. So it's not very big, but there's a lot going on in that area that you just have to get to because they. I know that you know they touch it, and then plus if they had it, you don't know where the droplets land. So it's just a matter of touching everything, cleaning it, and then disinfecting it. How do you deal with like the electronics, like the radios and all that stuff? If you're like getting any of that wet, wouldn't that create problems? That's a great question. One reason that we had a lawyer draw up a coronavirus contract. So whatever we whoever we clean for, we go over the specifics of the contract because there are issues when you have to leave like an electronic wet. On some of the electronics, we will sit there and actually, instead of wetting it with the gun, we'll fog it out, but we will have to keep manually wiping it off. If we can see it starts to dry off, we wet it again. We do the best we can and we tell them we're not responsible because it's what has to be done. Um, like in the plants, when we, in the control rooms, we're not allowed to touch any keyboards, switches or anything all we can do is the counters around everything because everything's so sensitive and it's set to certain programs for the electric company that's probably the scariest room is are the control rooms but it's just a matter of are these like nuclear power plants no but it's i've never been into a power plant so to me it's really, Chernobyl. i mean you gotta be careful remind you of really because they're like don't touch this this and this and we're like so we're only doing the white the counter that we can see, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because we clean one power plant three times because of the coronavirus. The first time we went in there, we're all in suits and people are walking around with their hands. They see us in suits and gloves and masks and shields and they're touching everything. The second time they're doing the same thing. They're touching the doors. They have no gloves on. The third time, lo and behold, behold this guy, they all come out in suits and gloves and they were finally ready for it. And I'm like, didn't you learn the first time when we're on the suits and gloves, we don't touch any handles. We open things with the gloves or our shirts. No, they didn't learn. It took them three times to learn that. You know what? During this, the next probably four or five months, you're going to be wearing gloves to touch something. Or as soon as you touch it, you're going to have to go wash your hands, use a sanitizer. But people, they really don't think that it can affect them until there's a lot of people that from their company, they get, I mean, I think this one plant had like, 35 people sick with it. So we cleaned it three times within, I think, 10 days. Because Are they, Do they wear respirators now when they work? They sure do. <laughs> now they do, but except in the control room. It, it's funny because one gentleman actually worked in the control room and they still don't wear the respirators. And a lot of, the, a lot of them are older guys and they're like, oh, you know, we're fine. If we get it, we get it. It's part of God's work. I'm thinking, well, but, but you can protect yourself. I mean, it may be part of God's work, but how about let's take a little precaution and extend your life. Don't let it be your fault that you get sick. Let it be a, maybe another reason, but definitely not because you're not just protecting yourself with gloves and a mask. That's something simple that everyone can do. So we're talking about gloves and masks, all the PPE. Can you explain a little bit like what the proper PPE is to do this type of work? 
All right, well, let me first by starting. Most cleaning companies really can't be compliant with OSHA to do this type of cleaning. I'm gonna show you our company book that's OSHA compliance. I mean, it has our hazard communication plans, our bloodborne pathogens, everything. If they come in and ask that we need, it's all in this book that's available in our trucks or in our office. That's the first step. The second step is just to check your insurance because if someone were to get sick and you just have a, your insurance listed underneath the janitorial contract or cleaning, you're not going to be covered. We're listed under environmental restoration. So I know we're covered. And right now with all that's going on, the insurance company is starting to crack down on who is doing the cleanings because if you're not, if you don't have that in your clean, you know, whatever your insurance contract is, you're going to be stuck with a big bill, especially if you hurt another person, an employee or a building. I mean, nonetheless, uh, PPE, another thing you probably need to be trained so, on. Before, before you move on, I mean, it's just really important. I don't want anybody to miss that. So if I'm going to be doing this type of work, going into space where there's like a level one, two or three, you know, COVID cleanup case that I'm taking on, I need to let my insurance company know I'm doing that work and they're going to give me a different, what they call scopes code. And they're going to charge me, I presume, a higher workers' comp rate for people doing that type of work? Definitely. Yeah, I can tell you the money is awesome, but we pay a hefty premium for all our insurances because of that reason, because of too many unknowns. There's too many unknowns in our line of work. I mean, whether you're doing crime scene, disease control, there's too many uncertainty, uncertainties that we don't know, and they can't even explain. So, so we're protected. They're going to charge us a lot just so we know we're covered. And I don't mind because the money's great and I can, you know, cover the cost, but you want to be, make sure your company and your employees are protected and you, I mean, especially if this is your life. Why would you want to do something and not be covered? And one mistake could cost you a, your life, your employee's life, a client's life, a business. I mean, and it's a, it's a long list of what it could cost you. It's not worth it. Sharon, is this, um, would you say that this is the same thing on just residences? So if somebody's um, in their own home and they're saying, hey, my husband's coworker thinks he might have been exposed, you want to make sure before you go into that house that you have special insurance and um, all the PPE you're going to talk to us about in a minute? Correct. And you know, it, it seems simple because a lot of the CDC recommendations and as we go in our power plants and buildings, we see a lot of bottles that are that has bleach and it says bleach on there and it's broken down one to ten. It tells you what it is on each bottle and they go in and they use that. And sure, I mean, I'm in a drill time and it's good. But just think you can't use bleach on everything. Bleach does corrode some items. And who wants to breathe that continually? You, you really can't. Even our disinfectants that we use, that's why you have to have the proper PPE because it does give you a few respiratory issues. I mean, if, if you don't have a mask on, you're gonna, your eyes are going to be irritated. Your lungs are going to be irritated and it's going to be hard for you to breathe and you're going to need to step outside and you can't because you're in full suit. Because if you go outside, you got to take it all off and start all over again. So you mentioned the breathing. You know, you hear a lot about the... N95 respirators and everybody's looking for those because supposedly that protects you from uh, coronavirus. But if you're using some of these disinfectants, especially if you're fogging or misting, is, is the typical N95 enough or do you need something more substantial than that? Well, we use full face mask respirators or a half face. We have either the full face or the half face respirator, a face shield, the safety goggles, and then the suits. And then we, we triple glove. No matter what scenario we do, we always triple glove. Um, we'll clean a room and then we, everyone leaves and the person that fogs or uses the gun, the gun goes first and then the fogging comes last. So he's the only person in there usually and he, he just works his way back out of the room. But the personal protective equipment, the PPE is crucial. I mean, N95 is okay if you're going to the, in my opinion, if you're going to the grocery store, something like that. It, it's a simple, small mask. It's great if you're going in a home cleaning and you want to protect someone from a cold or something. But I think you need a little bit more than that for the this type of cleanup. I mean, right. it, it just added protection. Why would you want to 
shortcut yourself and just go the, to the second, the next level and get something that can protect everyone. So you're basically covered from head to toe and Tyvek suit. Um, what type of footwear do you guys use? Tyvek suit. Well, we're always in still toe shoes because okay. of the plants. We always have to have still toe shoes and in the plants themselves, we have to have hard hats. So you're talking in closed suit with the booties and the, the hood. We also have booties over our uh, booties. Then you put your respirator, the goggles. Double booties. No, but we, we, we are extra safe, Tom. We are double and tripling everything because it, it's not worth it. One more pair of booties, one more pair of gloves. Right. At a certain yeah. point, you can only, you only have to move a little bit anyway. So what does it matter if you have three pair of gloves on? It's just added protection. It's not overkill, I promise you. I had a gentleman tell me that. I said, it's overkill to you, but it's extra protection to me and my employees because we know what's out there. I mean, and it's serious. It's, some things are really serious, like COVID-19. It's killing people. Some people may get like a flu-like symptoms, but it's actually killing people. And that is scary as all get out. I mean, I don't want to be killed by this because I love my job. Right. So like you're decked out in like this, this full PPE gear. How hot does that get? I mean, it's some, I mean, you can't, how, how long can you work in that before you need to take, you know, that respirator off and breathe real air? We've done five hours. The first time we did a, the power plant, we had to stop at five hours because it was actually a cool night, like 45 but in the plants, they're so hot. And then when you add the added suit, and then plus on level three, I'm sorry, I didn't get to level three. We wear two suits. <laughs> oh, okay. It is, it's very hot, but once you do it, it's not really uncomfortable. It may, you may get a little heated, but you learn how to breathe and adapt. And all our workers know, if you get hot, you go outside, take it all off, take a 30 minute break. We have, you know, ice packs and stuff, cool down. Then you just come back in and find us and you do that. But we have to, we'll take a break after five hours. Um, here lately, we've been very good since we've done a couple plants. It doesn't take us five hours anymore. It, it's a matter of getting your, your systems down and how you're going to do it. We all do the same jobs and we work very well together. So it's actually a lot easier now since we have two weeks underneath our belt. So like when you're taking all that equipment off, I guess you have to take a lot of precautions there, not to take so re re like? stuff. So you don off. That's why you need the proper training of the PPE outer gloves first. Everything else can come off at the finale. Your suit's going to come off everything. You take it inside out your last gloves all inside out, everything, your shoes inside out one person. I'm usually the last person that takes everything off because I get all their gear. It goes in bags and totes. Uh, the suits get pitched, the respirators, the filters gets pitched because after each one, we replace the filters. Uh, and I go back and we, we, before we leave, whatever job we have, extension cords, tools, whatever we have, we have job boxes. It all gets disinfected. We stay there 10 minutes, well time for our equipment also. We take it back to the shop and that's where I'll, we soapy water everything with the, our respirators and all that. Okay. It's just a long process. A job may take you four hours, but you're talking another hour beforehand, sometimes an hour and a half afterwards, just to get everything back into working condition for the next job. Yeah. I'm exhausted just listening to all of that. <laughs> but, but I am like kind of impressed that you can go five hours uh, double suited with all of that stuff on. I was totally expecting to hear you say two hours. <laughs> yeah. like, I'll tell you um, why. It's hard. Fortunately for us, we stocked up a little bit because we're members of an association and they warned us, start stocking up because th people are going to run out of things. So we stocked up on our suits, but we're actually still running out of suits and you know we're continually order ordering them, fortunately that suits aren't as bad as the gowns that the doctors needs, but you, you, you get used to it. I mean, they, all our workers are individuals and they know how long they can take. If, if there's, if it's hot outside, it, you know, 80 degrees outside, we probably couldn't make it more than two, three hours, but being 45, 50 degrees, it's actually sort of cool. But it's not as bad. You get thirsty. You got to go to the bathroom. I mean, all that, I mean, you just, 
going to have to suck it up, I guess, huh? You do. And one thing we do when we know we have a, a long job, we take electric light pills. That helps retain your water and it helps you not have to go to the bathroom. And we usually take those in the beginning of the day so it lasts the rest of the day. And they really do help. So the next day you don't wake up drained, totally tired. They don't energize you, but you're as long as you replenish your water and your electrolytes, you're good to go the next day. I mean, like I said, we've been going since the 22nd every single day and I haven't had anyone call off. They're all, they all get excited too. But, oh, yeah, another job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just preparation. As long as you have your systems in place, you can do it, but you have to do it the right way. Do it the safe way and do it the OSHA way. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I mean, oh, yeah. It, yeah, I heard somewhere that you have some type of a training for this. Is that accurate so that people can do it the right way? How do they learn to do it the right way? We're members of the American Bio Recovery Association. That's if I could give you any recommendation, go through that association and pick one of those members that train you. There's a lot of people out there that you can do stuff online, like the yeah. 40 hour. That's something you have to go get that. You need the hands on experience. These people at, at the ABRA, American Bio Recovery Association, they're certified. Most of these people, we're very fortunate. They are. Um, infectious disease control people, they give us a list of stuff and protocol, what to follow. I mean, we're lucky that they have, they knew ahead of time, I think in like November, that this may be coming to America from China, that they had some words. So get someone that has the knowledge and they're, check their credentials because some of these people for $99, you're not going to get the proper training for $99. I don't think you're going to get it for $1,000. We paid a lot more than that, but you get what you pay for. So, so you guys, you guys were starting to prepare for this back in November. There, there was someone that mentioned um, the the White House cancel council theory or whatever. He had published some articles and did some interviews saying that an outbreak was destined to happen. And go back and check it. I, th I think he even mentioned it in like 2017 that this a pandemic was going to be coming, and November, they um, sent out an email. December hit. You could no longer find the electrostatic guns. They were foggers. I actually don't use a regular fogger. I use a mode remediation fogger because they're so hard to find. And they, to me, the, air, the houses that we do and the buildings that we do, they work better. But December, it was hard to find N95 masks. People were starting to hoard them because... As you can see here, I think it was like in January, everybody was trying to sell stuff on eBay for an ungodly amount of money because they knew and they went out and bought sanitizer and all this stuff. But the big thing was the suits, gloves, and the electrostatic guns. People bought those up really quick and before anyone had a chance, or at least companies had a chance to buy more, get them ready available for to clean for the pandemic. Wow. I, um, I have two questions. Uh, one is Greg has a question, Sharon. He wants to know if you guys use a buddy system to make sure that everybody's following the protocols. We do. We, we never split up as a team. We may have nine people on a job. We're in the same room together. And I've had many requests to split up in the power plant. But like I said, we work well together. We have one older gentleman and we all check on them. We all, we all know how we react to certain things like with the respirators, the two suits. So everyone knows we're like in a row. You sort of know how to check on them and make sure everything, everyone's okay. Because I think one or I think twice he had to leave and he waited till we took a break and then he came back in with us. But you know, they know you can't, it's something that you can't, don't wait another hour or 30 minutes. If you feel yourself overheating, you have to immediately go outside get some ice, cool down, get some cool water and let your body change, you know, get the temperature back up to what it should be or you back down to what it needs to be. Uh, my next question. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. I mean, you, you have so much information. My, my brain kind of is already starting to feel full. We're only halfway into this call. <laughs> I'm just thinking, gosh, like you would not be able to figure this stuff out on your own. You need someone to train you like the, like the electrolyte pills. Right. You know that nobody's going to be able to figure that out. Right. Right. Um, but my question was, 
um, when you're when you're shopping for some of these things, and specifically, I'm talking about the Tyvek suits. I see all different types of price points around Tyvek, right? Mm -hmm. I can see them as low as four dollars. I can see them for as much as sixty dollars. What what's the difference there? Well, there's Tyvek suits. There's there's different types, um, and there's different Clean Guard suits. Clean Guard suits we use for uh, more along the lines of the blue suits, bloodborne pathogens. Tyvek suits. There may be some Tyvek suits that have the hood but don't have the booties. Some may not have the hood or the booties. And you, we use a certain brand that has the hood and the booties, but I pay probably, I think 12 something, 12, some 1260 something for our suit. And then I charge, I think it's 1862 when we use the suits all, you know, it's like you know, else you upcharge a little bit. Our filters, I charge a little bit more for them. Um, I think our filters, we, I charge 1675 for the little respirators. And I think they're around 10 bucks. At on normal prices, a normal Tyvek suit, normal Tyvek suit that you can probably get from John Don could be anywhere from seven eighty five up to maybe fifteen, depending on the size and the num the number you use. So there's different types of them. But now people like the N ninety five mask, great example. I see people selling those for ten dollars a pop. Oh my God, those suckers should be. At the most two bucks a piece i mean i'm telling you people have gotten rich and it's it's sort of sickening because come on people you know maybe at first they thought all right i can make a lot of money but when this hit so quick and it killed so many people and all the the hospitals and stuff needed the equipment at a certain point come on go donate it you made some money donate what you have left and do something good for what you did i mean something good can come out of you hoarding a whole bunch of N95 masks that not everyone could use. And mainly the people that helped, you know, the hospitals that really need those masks are the people that's hurting and the, and the people that are sick. It's, it's sort of sad. Yeah. It is. Uh, you, you also said something else, Sharon, sorry to pull us off track, but I, I'll lose my question if I don't ask. Um, you were talking about charging uh, different prices for different things. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that maybe you charge a price, but then you have add-ons for different things. Is that right? Right. Because every time you order equipment, the price always changes because sometimes one uh, vendor might be out of it and another yeah. one has it. So we, I have a, a set price when I charge people. Um, here's what I charge when I do our invoices. A su I have three supervisors. So a supervisor is $295.25. The, our biotechs are $142.75 and we pay them 50 bucks an hour. We charge six, we charge $67.75 for 75 microfiber towels. We charge the respirators. The, the Tyvek suits are $18.72, I believe. And the respirator filters are, I think, $16.38 or something. So we charge oh, for the respirator. The microfiber, I'm sorry, Sharon, the microfiber towels. So you, oh, you throw those away. You don't. We do. Correct. Correct. Okay. Those get thrown away, but they, they've been known to actually pick up, as you guys know, extra bacteria, bacteria. So we use those when we clean and disinfect everything with the high touch areas. Okay. And I think that's all I charge for. Mobilization fee, the suits, the respirators, the towels. Oh, the, whatever disinfectant I'm using, because we have three disinfectants that we use. And the electric company, with all their engineering and chem labs, they reduce this to two because there's one that's a stronger one that interferes with a lot of their equipment. So we're not allowed to use that at their plants or their buildings. And then, yeah, the labor. And that's all we charge for. <laughs> oh, that's all. That's oh. it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so what's a mobilization fee? Well, because I don't, since I pay them $50 an hour while we're cleaning, it helps documentation fees and pay a little bit more when I can pay them up, you know, 12 bucks an hour. Cause some places we go are two, three hours away. So I had to pay, I like to pay them something besides the $50 an hour because this is hard work. Yeah. The money is absolutely incredible, but you can be really physically exhausted. Even if you take your pills five hours in a suit, when you are hand touching everything. And when we do these big power plants, we may go in, 
45 different office build areas. So one after another, it's sort of, it, it's a little tiring, but like I said, now we're used to it, but they they deserve every penny of it because they're, they work their butt off and they do it the right way. That's the key. You got to do it the right way. You cannot have any shortcuts, not in this line of work. You really can't. Uh, you were also saying, Sharon, that you pay $50 for your techs. Uh, what, do you, what do you pay your supervisors? Do you mind if I ask that? And <laughs> well, if you do that, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. If our supervisors, I'm at $295, Sharon's getting paid $295, 25 an hour. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. but, uh, so I usually cut it off at $125. And I'm not going to lie because my sister and I are owners in the company. So we get a, we get that extra bonus of getting the extra money revenue from the business so i usually cut ours out at 125 i mean i was just being okay. as part of pants. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> i like it i like that you're getting 295 just saying well, I mean, <laughs> I don't it, it really is hard that. work it really is hard yeah. work. But i charge yeah. that that's I'm my energy in 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 bio in crimes uh trauma cleanup it's the same fee i charge for that line of work too yeah. well i mean it's a lot of education too this isn't just the work that you're doing at that point in time, there's a lot that goes into this. So, right. If a homeowner called you yeah. up and said that, you know, a family member has had COVID 19 and, you know, we want to get our three bed, two bath, 2,000 square foot home disinfected, what would that take? And, you know, how, what would that process look like? How long would that take? Probably a lot longer than I do with the plants. The plants are really simple because they're offices and there's not a lot of clothing or porous materials. Everyone takes their stuff home. There's not a lot of things laying out except for staplers, you know, the phones, the mouses and, you know, the pins and that line of things. I would bet, a, just say a 2,000 square foot house, three bedroom, two bath. I bet it may take close to five hours because there's a lot more there that you have to clean. Is, is that five? Is that five like clock hours for your whole team, or just five labor hours? It'd probably be close to five labor hours, and I'll tell you why. Because, yeah, we do the high touch areas as far as the knobs, the doors. We do a little bit more. I don't like just doing a doorknob or around the door handle. I like doing where where people touch. Guys are going to lean up here on top of a door. So we, we wipe a lot. I wipe all the cabinets, the drawers, inside the drawers, the lips, where I think they're going to touch. A house is going to have a lot more activity. So I think that would take a lot longer between four and five hours. You're, you're probably looking at, if I had, let me try to do the numbers real quick. If I had, say, four people with me, five hours, where's my calculator? Okay. Let me use my calculator real quick. So 1180, 2272 plus uh, 1180, 3454. 3454 is just labor. So then you're probably looking at, you might be looking at 300 towels. So that's another... What seventy one forty two eighty mobilization fee is two seventy five. You'd have five filters at let's just say hundred bucks. Oh, I cleared it off twenty four twenty two plus. You said three hundred towels. Is that three hundred like dollars worth of towels or no three hundred? I charge per seventy five, so it's three hundred towels. I would say at least that might be more. You're probably looking about. $4,500 to clean a 2,000 square foot house. It may not be as bad if they didn't have a lot of things sitting out. But when you have a lot of things sitting out, like I said, we're touching all that. We're going to clean it by hand before we gun it. Because we do it we do it three ways or threefold. Everything gets hand touched and wiped. We come through, one person comes through with a gun and gets all those high touch areas. And then the last thing we do is fog. So I call it the triple effect because I'm going to make sure that house or that office building is super clean. There is nothing's going to escape us. I mean, because you don't know how long the droplet, the COVID-19 droplet, they say it could stay in the air four hours, but they don't know. 
There's too many uncertainties. They don't know how long does it stay on a, a, a met, piece of metal. It could be up to nine hours or it could be four days. I've heard so many contradicting opinions. Yeah. So I take that out of the equation. I prefer to do it high touch areas, the gun, so it saturates everything, and then we fog it. And to me, I do a great enough job that I don't think that I'm going to have anything left. But the one thing bad about the COVID-19 with the asymptomatic people and the symptomatic people, I can clean a house. The next day someone comes in and they can recontaminate it. That was, mm. And that was part of the problem, why they didn't want to sign my contract, because we did the power plant three times, remember. You don't, it could be the guys not wearing gloves, but it could have already been somebody that was sick. They didn't know they were sick yet. So this is a crazy disease that could cost a lot of money for cleanup because for those reasons. And for me doing it the way I do it, I like it. But then again, someone could come in the next day or a couple of days later, touch something and get something affected. And then there it goes spreading it again. So it's going to be a very costly cleanup. Forget the economy part of it. The cleanup is going to be astronomical for some of these companies. Wow. Absolutely. I have two more questions, Sharon. It sure. seems I've always have two. Um, the, the first question is, is that price the same regardless, level one, level two, level three? I know you said you wear the same PPE, but do you charge the same as well? Yep. The only you thing that's different part? on level one, the, I came into the agreement on level one. If it's a if it's a twenty thousand square foot building, and if they can guarantee me that, or and themselves that they know the the foot traffic of that individual, if they know because we've done a couple of them, if they mm -hmm. can tell me exactly the floor plan where they walked, the hallways, the offices they visited, the lunchroom, I will do it that way. But I still fog the rest of the building. I, to me, you can't be overprotective. You might as well just fog it because of the un, un con, the concerns of the, how long does the virus stay around? They just don't know yet. So I would prefer to just fog the other areas. It makes your coworker your coworker want to come into work because they know the whole building got done, not just where Joe walked down to pick up a sandwich, stopped here and ate, stopped here and talked to Mary. You know, it's it sort of it's the best practice. It really is. Well, and it makes sense to me because maybe Joe walked here, left a little bit of COVID uh, right yeah. here, but then Mary came along and grabbed some and took it somewhere else. Yeah. So they don't, yeah. when I, I had to do scenarios for the, co the electric company and they didn't, it took them, I swore almost a week to get that and that someone else could have picked it up and transferred it. And they finally, we finally agreed on these three scenarios. So it's just easier. I mean, why, why would, I'm already there. Why would you want to send me back again to incur more, more calls? Just let me fog it. It doesn't take a person that long to fog a building. It really doesn't. So if you fog the entire building, but you're fogging space that you haven't wiped down yet, are you making any claims of it being disinfected? What is the efficacy no. of, of fogging that space? It's just to give the coworkers, like I said, the first week, they had so many panic workers. It was crazy. Everyone was saying they had a runny nose. He had a cough. I need to, I need my space cleaned. I mean, I can't, I drove us crazy. Cause we're like, okay, we'll get there. But we got two hours here and maybe three hours here. And it was a long first week. It, it really is just a safeguard to make sure nothing's still there because I don't just fog it. I mean, I use the gun. The gun is always first. And then we fog it. I don't high touch those areas, but it's the high touch area is get done, getting done with the fog. And the because gun is the electrostatic. The gun's the electrostatic spray. Because it wets it and it makes sure it sticks on whatever we hit. It. Whatever it hits, it stays on there. So it's almost guaranteed to be a uh, 10 minute dwell time. I mean, a, a lot of the areas I tell them, we may have some phones or some keyboards that don't work, but you know what? It's clean. And I guarantee you there's no germs on that sucker. Okay. I had another question, Sharon. Um, when you, like, if you were to clean a house, um, and you've done all of this work. Is there a certain amount of time that you want the house to remain vacant before people are allowed back in? Right. Well, actually, the CDC recommends that you don't clean anything for 24 hours. Well, with the electric company, we can't wait. I mean, there's some areas like the control rooms. We have to get right there. They, they can't. They usually have two control rooms. 
it takes them 30 minutes to close to open the other one down up before they can close the other one down and so the times are, uh we got restraint time but you're really supposed to after we clean it you're not supposed to be in there for three to four hours because of the disinfectant and the irritants. So, and then after that, you're supposed to ventilate it and open the windows for, I always tell them a day. I'd prefer them not to go in there for a day, especially if it's a house. So what the electric company is actually doing is after we're done, we open all the doors. They usually have a couple of workers outside in the parking lot waiting for us. And they stay there all night and leave the doors and windows open and then close them the next day before the workers come in because some of their buildings they can afford to, the people can go home and do the work from home, but other buildings, they have to get back in there and go to work. So they don't have a choice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Heather just popped on here. And so uh, the question, uh, you might have to go back and watch the, this video, Heather, because Sharon has shared so much information. Um, but her question here is, um, do you have a recommendation on where to learn the proper way to use a fogger for dis disinfection? But she's going to tell you that that's not enough. <laughs> you need way more than just it's, learning that. It's not enough. You need to start with the owner guide, owner's guide, and go with the manufacturer. Go to their website. There's a lot of videos on all of the manufacturer's website, how to use it properly. And then look at all the disclaimers. I mean, like the guns, it'll tell you you can't use it. anyone that has a pacemaker and you may not know if someone has a pacemaker. There, there's a lot of things that go into this stuff. Uh, the defibrillator, you can't use that within, I think, 10 feet of that. So a lot of our, every office building that we clean has had those. So we always watch out whoever does the high touch areas. We do this. Someone gets to the attention as points. So we know where big breaker boxes are, any kind of uh, medical equipment. You just learn to watch out for that kind of thing. I mean, that's their, our first four people as they clean. That's what their job is to look for the big breaker boxes, any kind of medical device. But like the pacemaker, some things you would never know if someone's walking by in the plants because we do areas at a time um, where the guys just walk through and walk out right in front of us. Something like that you would never know. So I would never want to put someone in harm's way so you, we don't use it and that it's always off until we get into the area when we're getting ready to use it. So go to the manufacturer. I mean, you really, it, it, that's what you really need to do. You also mentioned earlier, Sharon, you've mentioned a couple different times the number of people that you take in and that you guys always stay together. Um, do you have uh, like a certain number of people per square foot or how do you determine how many people are going in? Like you wouldn't put the same amount of people in a 2,000 square foot house right. that you would put no. in no. power plant. In our power plants, we take everyone. On a, a building that, a lot of the buildings probably average five to 6,000 square foot. And I take, one, two, there's five of us. I don't, I don't like going less than five because we all have certain jobs. So we're all used to that person doing a certain job. So we have two or three people that do the first couple jobs. So I can do without the extra people. But the back end is imperative that we, there's certain protocol that we follow. And for us to get our job done quickly and efficiently, we keep the same people that's always there. I just add what's people to do the high of, touch area. What's an example of a, a job? You're talking about people doing different jobs. What 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 are these jobs? The last person would be the fogger. The second person would be the the second from the last would be the gunner. The first set of people are the high touch areas. Those are the people, like I said, look for the medical devices and think, breaker boxes, anything that could be a device that could interact with the um, the gun. I'm usually the gunner person. But before that, before they start, we always take a walk around the floor plan and look, and we try to remember the areas that we go into. But with me being second to last, sometimes I'm the fogger too. You just learn to look for everything. The, the third, the person in front of the gunner always double checks everything on the desk to make sure it looks like the stapler's wet. Everything's wet. Everything was touched. Every pin, the markers, it's sort of the mindset, what, the, what each person has, they know what their job entails. So we know every, we cross all our T's and dot the I's. Is the high touch yeah. person actually applying a, spraying on a disinfectant with the idea that it sits there for 10 minutes? No, that is the person. I, we just like, that's the first part of it. We like to hand touch everything as far as staplers, keyboards, pin, 
every marker, every pair of scissors. You're just, you're just, you're just cleaning it with a regular cleaner. Cleaning it with, cleaning right. it with no, 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 no. We use a regular cleaner if at first when the plants were dirty. When we go into these buildings, a microfiber and the disinfectant. That's on all high touch areas. That's first. You're using the disinfectant to clean with. Yeah, we are. Yeah, okay. but if it's dirty, it's got to be cleaned before we even go to that stage. That's just the yeah. that's the pre stage, the clean part. Okay. But, so yeah. you're making four four stages. If it's dirty, right. the first stage is just getting the dirt off. Correct. Correct. Okay. But that's what I said. We hand touch everything. The gun does it again, all the high touch areas, and then the fogging does the whole the whole room itself. You mentioned a two thousand square foot home. You could you would use up to three hundred towels. Liz, okay. how many homes? How many just general maintenance clean? How many homes would we clean with three hundred towels? I use a lot less towels than most companies, so I'm not sure I'd use that many in a year. Oh. <laughs> oh. Because we fold ours, and you're not supposed to move. I don't like using more than one or two square foot per per, per flip. So once something gets dirty, if there's visible dirt on it, they have to flip it and you turn it. And if your towel is too dirty, you get a new towel. It's just, I'm not gonna add, bring, contribute that dirt to a, another area. They know if something's dirty and you can't flip your towel over and there's nothing on it, you go get a new towel. Well, yeah, and it's different. Sense. Power plants are totally different too. I mean, even office buildings, there's a, a lot of different grime that you get is it's, it's not worth transferring. I need it clean so I, my disinfectant does the first job and then it's ready for the gunner and the fogger. So just get a new towel. I mean, I'm not paying for it, but they want it done the right way. Yeah. So just get you a new towel. They're like a, a penny or you know, a nickel or something. It's, it's just not worth it. Sharon, and this, it, is, yeah. this is obviously dangerous work. In the years you've been doing this, because you guys have been doing this since 2004? Five, 2005. Uh, have you ever had any close calls where somebody's suit rips or something happens where you know it was, a, it was a close call a scary moment the only incident we had as a, in a couple meth labs when we were cleaning we one time we picked up a mattress and there was still chemical i guess the police didn't see him because they had it hid underneath the mattress there was chemicals in a mountain dew bottle and usually you can tell the coke bottles it likes to put bubbles or something on the top and it was actual part of the chemicals they used to do the meth so that's sort of scary because we're cleaning there with different chemicals and that could have ignited a, an explosion or something flammable. So that was probably our scariest moment. Other than that, I mean, we've had, we found guns, we found bullets that so you have to stop and call the police, but nothing except for the meth part that was like life that could be life altering to any of our employees or, you know, myself. Okay. Wow. This is, it's a different world, isn't it? It is it's sort of scary. This is a new question, Sharon. So if someone had COVID-19, but they vacated the home for two weeks, would you still do this entire process? Well, the CDC, well, would you recommend it? the CDC says after someone has the symptoms for at least seven, I think seven to nine days, you don't really have to clean. I maybe, I probably wouldn't go to the links that I do, but I sure would at least high touch everything and gun everything just, you know, for my safe of mind, as you know, my peace of mind. I mean, just so no one else. More psychological say It is. Sometimes yeah. it really is. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. At least a, base, at least a basic disinfectant. Yeah, I mean, they could never hurt anything. So I, like I said, there's too many uncertainties. They don't know how, how long it stays on different circuits, you know, like metals, uh, carpets. If they knew for sure, It'd be easy to answer that question, but they they don't know for sure. I mean, different experts have different opinions, but if they don't know, I'm going to go take the extra precaution to do everything I can to make sure that area is clean and safe, so someone can come back into work and know, wow, I can touch my keyboard and do my stuff and answer my phone. I'm good to go. So you reminded me of another question. Sorry, Tom, <laughs> I have to ask this, or I'll forget again. Well, you're no, no, yours. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so earlier you had talked about. Um, it was going to take more time to do the home than it would be the power plant because, and one of the things you mentioned was because of the different surface surfaces, there's a lot more um, forest surfaces. You mentioned clothing. So are you cleaning all the clothing, the bedding? What's happening there? 
you're supposed to launder the clothing. Like you can actually wash your, like if I didn't have a, if my spouse had the COVID, I could actually wash their stuff with my stuff. As long as you're cleaning it in the, with the, in the hot, with hot water, you're, you're fine. The, C, the CDC says. So anything porous, I would just take down, wash it in hot water. And that should be good. To, you should be good to go there. Shampoo, you can shampoo your carpets with a disinfectant just to make sure that is safe. But usually, usually carpet sucks up the moisture anyway, so that it doesn't live very long on the carpet part of it. I would be more worried about the high touch areas than, you know, your knobs, your countertops, remotes, uh, things along those lines, your coffee maker. Furniture. Do what? Upholstered furniture. It would. What I'll tell you what we do in the offices. A lot of the offices have their fabric. Half of the chair is fabric. We I saturate them because it has to be able to get into all the whole part of the chair. You want to make sure it's wet enough so it soaks in and gets the whole entire part of the back and the bottom of the chair. So I mean, some things it may discolor. I haven't had any problems with the disinfectants that I use that it would do that. But you know, leather leather might leave some running runoff lines on it after ten minutes. It's it's something you may just have to deal, live with. At least you know it's safe. I mean, if you don't want it, I don't know what to tell you. Just go ahead and throw it away now if you don't want me to clean it. Right. Yeah. right. I mean, seriously, especially and if you have. I it, it sounds like you have contracts that kind of indemnify you from that, yeah, right? Exactly. Be because of the uncertainty and the unknowns and the symptomatic people and the asymptomatic people. So there's too many, too many variables that can come in and dirty it again and put off the disease anywhere. So I, I make it very clear when someone calls me, what happens? You got to tell them exactly why, how could that can happen? And just because you clean, how, how can they come in and dirty it again? They, they don't, sometimes it, it's a mindset. They don't understand that. You just got to go over all the scenarios with them. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Liz? I guess I did have another question, but I forgot it. Uh, okay, let me go back to the other one real quick. When you were talking about going in and um, we were talking about, like the clothing and the carpets, are you including all of that in your $30,454 price? Are you expecting them to do some of that? If they do some of that, that would help. I just, that's just probably a guideline, the price. If I have to do all that, you yeah. can spend a lot longer in a home. If I, if they want me to take down all the drapes and all that, I have no problem doing that. Or I could saturate everything, but the clothing alone needs to go in the, you know, in the washing machine in the hot setting that has to be done. But the yeah. drapes, something like that and the furniture and a coat sitting out, I can saturate it with the disinfectant, but eventually they're going to have to wash it before they wear it anyway. Yeah. I, I did have another question, Sharon. Do you have, um, a, as far as your disinfectants that you use, do you have a favorite or um, mm -hmm. is there something that makes you think, oh, this is, I like this better than this because of this reason or? I like Shockwave. Shockwave is a very strong disinfectant and they're the ones that the uh, electric company wouldn't let me use because of the, Oh. all the uh, hazards and the flammability, but I like microban, germicidal and Milgold plus are two really good uh, disinfectants. I've been using the microban germicidal for all the electric plants that we do. Shockwave and a power plant probably wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I even got that. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Whoa." laughs> <laughs> There's even one like the Pro Lexus guns use pure tabs and it's actually a really good, it doesn't smell. It's, I really like it, but they wouldn't let me use it because of it's considered with the EPA registered disinfectants, it's registered as a pesticide. And they told me unless I had a pesticide license that I, I wasn't allowed to use it. I said, no problem. I have another alternative. Okay. Oh yeah. I didn't know that about the pure tabs. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just, Amber, you is, I mean, all their engineers and chemists, they went over all our MSD sheets and they were really particular. I mean, I liked it because I learned a lot about the different chemicals and disinfectants that we use, but they were all about uh, making sure it was safe to go on all the power plants and all their buildings. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're right up against uh, our hour here. Sharon, this is 
awesome information. Truly. Yeah, amazing. I apologize yeah. for talking so fast because I get so excited that I just like to ramble. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> there's, there, there, there's a lot of thinking about, you know, what do we as house cleaning companies do and how to react and what are the opportunities and this information, what you're sharing is, 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 is really needed for, you know, for us to get our minds wrapped around what, uh, what we actually are dealing with and, and, and what we need to be be doing moving moving forward. Are there any last thoughts that, that maybe we haven't asked or touched upon that that, that that you should share with us? No, just just think about it. A, a couple of two or three thousand dollars and it turns out that it could be your life and employee life, someone else's life, or you totally blow up something. I mean you think it's not possible, but it really is feasible. Just be careful. It's not worth losing your business, your home, your life's work. Be careful. And if you want to get the proper training, just go to an accredited place like the American Bio Recovery Association and get it done the right way. It's costly. But like I said, you pay for what you get. Get it done the right way. Don't go online. You need the hands-on training so you really know what you're doing when you get your first job. You're not scared. You're, you'll be relied on what you got, were trained with. And you'll be ready to go. You'll be happy. You won't be scared of thinking, oh, my God, did I do that right? You'll know you did it right if you did the proper, you know, got the proper training. So go out there and get to the right, the right place. It's well worth the money. Awesome. Well, and, and you guys were talking about something. Go ahead and grab your link, Tom, while I just mentioned this real quick. Tom has to put a link up for us. Um, but before we ever went live, you guys were talking. And, Tom, you just asked Sharon. So, what, what do you think about somebody that wants to go out and grab a fogger or grab a, an electric static sprayer and go out and start cleaning? I'm like, how, how do you recommend that they go about that? And Sharon, you said, I don't. They shouldn't. Don't do that. That's right. not good. It's not safe. You don't know what you're doing. And it, it's not going to be efficacious. So right. I, I just want to make sure that people on the call heard that because you guys were saying that offline before we ever went live. I think a lot of people, even even after this, I think a lot of people might think, well, I could do that. Well, that sounds fun. That sounds cool. Especially you do make it sound really cool, Sharon. <laughs> and you do make it kind of sound fun, too. <laughs> so I, um, thank, thanks for so much for sharing all this, Sharon, and just the the some of the detail, level of detail that you gave us. I mean, really, I was expecting you to say that you have your people wearing depends in those suits because they're not allowed to <laughs> five hours. <laughs> You're laughing, but I was. I was like, what? They take, they take those pills, they take the water. She's got them in diapers. I know she does. <laughs> don't give me any ideas now, Liz. Come on. <laughs> I don't think I'm giving you any ideas. <laughs> okay. Cleaning business today, we've got uh, some articles here about coronavirus that if you haven't seen, uh, would, would encourage you to uh, to look at. We just posted something yesterday with uh, Joe Walsh's article, not articles, but uh, I guess templates for us to do either a press release to uh, get the get the media involved with with helping us fix some of the some of the gaps in the PPP or the other is you can send a letter to uh, a, a congressman or, or a senator. Um, that information is useful. Got some feedback yesterday on that. Just want to mention that um, the PPP really <laughs> is designed to help your employees get a paycheck through uh, this, you know, the, the, this tough time, and, and we understand that. But you know, it needs to be done in a way where it's rational for. You know the, the business owner, the the economy as a whole, and just paying people when you have absolutely no work at all, plus when you've got a uh, uh, unemployment uh, rate of additional mon funds coming from the federal government that makes the compensation higher than what people will be making when they were working full time. All of those are incongruencies that 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 need to be figured out. So. You know, we're well aware that this program is, is for the benefit fit of our employees, but but it, but it has to be economically rational. So that's what, what Joe's trying to help us with. This is how you sub subscribe. If uh, you aren't getting our newsletters, your email, first name, last name. And as we share after every call, 
we've got a, a magic secret, secret link here that gives you all of our resources that you can access and download. By the way, we've got sponsors here. If you ever are on our website and, and you know, check out some of our sponsors. Direct Mop Sales is an awesome company. Matt mentioned that he actually gets a lot of his product from them. But um, we're going to go ahead and I'll get a link from, from Sharon for the American Bio. Uh, what, what's, what's that association, Sharon? American Bio Recovery Association. Bio Recovery Association. Um, and I'll, I'll place that here. So if you guys want more information about it, you can can come back here uh, tomorrow and, and, and find that. I'll go ahead and place a link to our resource page in the chat. I don't know if you can see the comments, Sharon, but Lisa Kirkpatrick is saying that she so appreciates your knowledge and that you're awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Again. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking that this is the quietest we've ever seen these people be on one of these <laughs> Facebook Lives. I think they are so busy just taking notes and listening and paying attention that Wow, I don't think they even had room to <laughs> comment. You, you really. Uh, Caleb says also, this was great. Thank you for this, Caleb Pierce. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah. Um, and actually, um, Heather earlier had said mind blowing. Uh, Danit had said awesome. Thank you. So a lot of um, great comments. Uh, Bridget in awe. She says Bridget <laughs> Randall. Uh, uh, yeah, I kind of feel like that too. I'm like. You know, I had a conversation with you many years ago about crime scene cleanup. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that time I walked away feeling like, wow, <laughs> just wow. <laughs> you are just, you are such a font of information. Um, and Lisa says it reaffirms this day in our wheelhouse for house cleaning. Yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, right. Right. Heather says no words, just trying to process it all. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think a lot of people are feeling that way. I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, again, much, much appreciated. You're doing something that's helpful to, to anybody that's in the cleaning business because we're all getting requests to, to help with uh, COVID-19 cleanup. And we need to know to ask the right questions and make sure that we're not uh, committing to do, doing work that, that, that we are properly trained and, and equipped to do. So. And don't have insurance for. Exactly. Don't forget that. Yeah. Very, very important. So um, it's Friday. So let's uh, let's remember to get some rest, take care of ourselves. Uh, this is a long race we're running. I know that uh, our worlds are, are kind of turned upside down at the moment, but uh, we're going to make it through this. But uh, we need to take care of ourselves and, uh, you know, enjoy your weekend. And, and we're going to be back here uh, next Friday at five o'clock. Um, we're going to have more information coming out over next the week. Monday. Monday. Next Monday. Monday. Next Monday. What did I say? Friday. Friday. No, this is Friday. We will be here Friday too, but we're going to be here Monday. Friday, Monday. Monday. <laughs> Monday. Yeah. Um, next Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to be. Um, doing some some special training we're putting together the program that, that that you guys asked us to do on on training for 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 how professional house cleaners uh should 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 be be cleaning during covid 19 and what we're going to be doing is nothing like what, what sharon just shared with you here we want you to hear this to understand what we're not going to be talking about but what we are going to be talking about is what is the proper ppe if you're going to be cleaning Mrs. Jones's house on a, on a, on a bi-weekly basis and the special things you need to be aware of now that, you know, COVID-19 is in the community and, you know, how do you properly clean and sanitize high touch areas? How do you keep your yourself clean as a cleaning technician? How do you keep uh, your, your clients safe? How do you uh, do the responsible thing within the community? Um, and this is going to be designed for your cleaning technicians. So, it's going to be Wednesday and Thursday. It's going to be four o'clock. We're going to have uh, on both days, and it's going to be a two-part class. They're going to be different. At the end, there's going to be um, a, a quiz that that uh, participants can take, and you know, successful completing it, you'll get a, a 
certificate of completion that will have the employee's name and, and your company name on it as well. And, and again, we're putting more information out this week and giving you more details as to where you can get it. But if you can be thinking about getting your cleaning technicians available that they can participate live on Wednesday and Thursday of next week at four o'clock. These are Eastern times, by the way. We're going to be recording it as well. And we're going to be putting it, you know, like in YouTube so they can go back and get it, get it later as well. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure that everybody understands, you know, how to do their jobs responsibly during this trying time, be it your job doing regular maintenance clean in a home or be it your job on the other end of the spectrum doing biohazard cleanup. We all need to understand, you know, what our jobs entail and what the risks are and how to do it responsibly. So we're going to be packing it on the end of residential cleaning, which is the world that, that we primarily live in. And again, that's going to be uh, Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Anything I missed, Liz? I don't think so. You did good, Tom. Okay. Been a long week, hasn't it? Yep. yep. Everybody, uh, take take a break. Get some rest. You know, it's even on the CDC website, right? It's one of the recommendations is to make sure you get enough sleep, get enough rest. It's one of the best things you can do to keep your immune system high. So we're not just saying get rest because we want to sleep more. <laughs> Although we do want to sleep more, um, but it's good for you too. Okay. Well, again, thanks. Thank you so much, Sharon. This was really good yeah, stuff. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys Monday at five o'clock Eastern. Y'all have a good have weekend. Good weekend all. Happy Thank Easter. You. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.